Hello everyone, welcome to our conversation. It's, a, it's an initiative of the Global Challenges Program. My name's Jeff Spinks and I'm one of the leaders of uh, the Global Challenge Program in Manufacturing Innovation and it's a great uh, pleasure to welcome you here today. The conversation format is, is um, meant to be informal. Uh, it's, it's meant to be a, a different way of, of presenting information. Um, it's a bit different to a, the, the traditional seminar. And this is the third one that we've run in this series. So it, it's, uh, so far it, it's been very successful and it's really terrific to see so many people come along today. So, so thanks very much for turning up. Obviously uh, we've got a, a tremendous uh, lineup of talent here today and it's, it's great to see that, that this is happening. Um, the Global Challenge Program provides funding principally to encourage interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary research across the university but it it's also has global connections, so hence in the name Global Challenges. And one of the things that we are able to do is provide some travel funding, and that is to allow University of Wollongong researchers to go overseas, to connect with uh, researchers overseas, but it's also to, to bring eminent researchers to Wollongong. And it's, it's a great uh, pleasure and privilege to have used some of our funding to help bring Ulrich to, to Wollongong uh, I mean, it's only a small part of the reason why Ulrich has come, I'm sure, but it has perhaps helped a little bit. And uh, to have someone of, of Ulrich's eminence here is really terrific. So I'm just going to hand over to, to Justin and Heath to, to kick things off, and I'm um, really looking forward to it. Thank Great. you. Thanks, Jeff. So, Ulrich, I want to welcome you to Wollongong. This isn't your first trip, you were telling me, that yeah, you've been I to Wollongong Yeah, I think a couple before. of years ago. I gave a talk many years ago, I think. Yeah, right. And don't exactly remember when it was. <laughs> Mark <laughs> should remember. Yeah, well, I asked Mark about this, and he, yeah. he said that he seems to rem yeah, remember that it was 10 years ago. Yeah, or so. it could so, be. So welcome back, I should say. Thank you. And um, hopefully we can, you're here for the Proteostasis and Disease Symposium, obviously, um, which we're holding over the next couple of days. Um, but it's great that we can have you know this sort of event, so it's open up to a few more people that um, aren't, aren't able to come along to the to the symposium, um, and to hear about your discoveries in your amazing <coughs> discoveries in sort of medical research, but also probably more interesting for some of the students is you know how you got into the field and also where you see the field going from here. I think that's probably what I'm looking forward to learning about some um, the most. Um, I mean, obviously, the last couple of years have been pretty busy. You've been travelling around the world a lot. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, some of that, obviously, uh, is because of some of the awards you've been, um, you know, so uh, lucky to, to to come across. I mean, uh, and the main one that you know that I was interested in, obviously, was the Lasker Award in 2010. Is that right? I think it was. Eleven. Eleven. Yeah. Is it? Right, so there you go. But the one that the students are probably the most interested in is the Heineken Prize. <coughs> Heineken Prize. Um, yeah. Because here of the in Australia beer. we yeah. think, you know, that is amazing that you can get a Heineken Prize. So um, <laughs> can, can you explain what the Heineken Prize is all about? What, where does yeah. that come from? The Heineken Prize is a prize when you go there, you don't get a single bottle of Heineken beer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, At least go. that was my experience. So but I got a lot of it. other good stuff. But it has been... Uh, uh, there has been a long tradition in having a prize in biochemistry and biophysics mm. that was given by the Heineken family. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, it has been extended to other disciplines. So it's, it's a really great uh, honor, obviously. I was, I was very pleased to receive it and a wonderful ceremony in Amsterdam. And before that uh, we had a, a trip around various universities in the Netherlands to give talks and meet with colleagues and uh, friends, and it was it was a wonderful experience. Yeah. yeah. And obviously, I mean, actually, uh, this year's prize winner was Chris Dobson. Yes, yeah. we're aware yeah. of that, and obviously, Chris has got quite yeah. um, good connections yeah. with um, you know some of the researchers here at Wollongong. So we're very happy to see that Chris might have a bottle of Heineken when we. They only give it every two next. every two years. Uh, okay, yeah. so we might have to wait to see if we can get a Heineken on Chris when we <laughs> when we go next time. And obviously, all of that was um, you know driven by this amazing sort of discovery that you and Art um, were able to describe that sort of went against the dogma of um, how proteins fold and yeah. you know, why we as a group are interested in proteostasis. But before we get to that, I was wondering, you know, I know that you did a medical degree when you were at Heidelberg. That's right, yeah. It's uh, it perhaps a bit unusual with hindsight. When I went to high school, uh, one 
route of access to biochemistry, which I always wanted to do already during high school or later years, was via studying medicine. And I would say that uh, I don't regret to have done it that way mm. because it gave me a somewhat different angle on things than most people who study biochemistry or molecular biology directly. But of course I had to do uh, a lot of learning uh, on, on the basic, uh, you know, basic facts that are relevant in our work. And I was lucky to be able to spend a lot of time in the biochemistry lab during my studies in Heidelberg. Well, I think I read that you, you classified that as your spare time. Yeah. Is that right? That but were, I did most of the, uh, the regular <laughs> studies I did in my spare time, I would say. It was, but nowadays this is no longer possible because everything is on schedule. You have to do certain things at specific times, these different courses, and but we could still arrange our own schedule and it was very good. So I think yeah. that I'm going to put this up as a, yeah. a, a poster for my students from now on that you know you can do a degree and also be studying for your PhD at the same time. Well, yeah. um, and in, that was exactly time, the right. I mean, time. I could start, <laughs> I could start doing my own experiments very early, much earlier than people who would study chemistry or biology. Yeah. So, so maybe you, that was an advantage. Yeah. So did you practice medicine or did you? I uh, did the formal to... courses, but I never practiced. I came to the conclusion that uh, it was the best decision I could take for human health if I'm not, <laughs> if I'm not practicing. I did enjoy it though, I mean, it's nothing wrong. I mean, I could have done that, but uh, it... Uh, and was there a time, I mean, was there a special thing that happened? I mean, I know with students I often get yeah. questioned, you know, is there a time when you just went, I really want to be a medical researcher, you know, that um, obviously there was something that said, I don't well, want to I be... I had all through my later high school years, you know, we could choose certain uh, focus areas and I had biology and chemistry and physics and so on. It became clear to me that this was a fascinating area and, and, and if it would be possible to become a researcher, it would be great. But of course, there is a lot of uncertainty, as you probably know, the students among you, uh, connected with, with this kind of decision. You never know how it really turns out. But I was just really very lucky the many lucky circumstances, probably starting in my childhood already and then later on. Yeah. yeah. And actually it was remiss of me to um, point out, <coughs> if anyone wants to ask a question while we're going through, then certainly you know, raise your hand like you're at school or something like that. <laughs> but we are going to have some time at the end, so if you then come, we can come back and we'll field some questions from them. But if there's a pressing thing of, I'm in a similar situation, I'm doing my medical degree and doing my PhD at the same time, I don't know what to do. <laughs> Um, then definitely um, interrupt us at that time. Um, so obviously from that, I mean, you studied, I think it was, was it peroxisomes and we, the, the, My work in the, for, the, for the doctoral thesis was on peroxisomes. That's a special type of cell organelle. And we were interested in what the peroxisomes were doing in, the, in metabolism and how they were generated. Uh, and at the time, some people said they are derived from the endoplasmic reticulum, and some people say they are separate organelles. Nowadays we know that there is a combination of both. But that gave then rise to my, after the doctoral thesis, to my move to Munich to the lab of Walter Neupert, where we studied how mitochondria are made and how mitochondria are importing proteins. And that was the precursor to the studies that we then did on protein folding. Yeah, so that's obviously what we, you know, yeah. know you so well for. Um, um, and obviously, I think we've got a picture of you and Art. Yeah. Um, well, that was in the late 80s, and uh, maybe that picture must have been taken maybe in 1990 or so. We, we visited the house of my parents in a yeah, small so village in the Black Forest uh, and took a walk. Probably my wife managed to make <laughs> this picture. Yeah, I think I, I saw <clears> that and was... And we were talking about our collaborative experiments. It was a very exciting time. So I think that uh, all the people here would love to hear how that, that first experiment yeah. came about. So well, that, uh, that different uh, lines of research that somehow converged. We, in, in Walter Neupert's lab, we studied how proteins are imported into mitochondria. I'm probably aware that mitochondria are the cell organelles that are required for energy production, production of ATP, where cellular respiration occurs. And, and these organelles contain many different proteins, perhaps a thousand or so. 
but most of them have to be made in the cytosol and then transported across the mitochondrial membranes. And at the time, in the late 80s, we and others had realized that this transport process, this translocation of a protein chain across the membrane required that the protein chain was in a fully unfolded state. And so it became clear to us that we could use the mitochondrial system as a model to understand how a protein chain would fold in an otherwise completely physiological environment, namely how it would fold after its transport into the inner space of the mitochondria. And we were already inspired by several you know, lines of evidence that perhaps protein folding assembly reactions were not entirely spontaneous. There was the work of John Ellis and others and uh, you pell them. And so we... Part, I was interested to read some... So Rubisco was one Yes. Of the... And so we, we were interested in the more fundamental question whether perhaps even the folding reaction of a polypeptide chain, not just its assembly into larger structures, might be dependent on the cellular machinery. In the context of the mitochondrial system, there was also the notion at the time that when the protein chain translocates across the membrane, there would be a, a translocation pore, that immediately after that it would fold up spontaneously and that this folding up would actually drive the translocation process because it wasn't quite clear what the energy source for this translocation would be. Why would a protein chain want to go across a membrane? And, uh, and so we set up experiments that uh, converged with findings that Art Horvich had. He had selected various yeast mutant strains that were defective in the uptake of proteins into the mitochondria. And one of those mutants was, behaved a little bit strange. <clears throat> it uh, seemed to allow the proteins to be imported into the mitochondria, but then something went wrong. And at that point, we had uh, interactions with art and uh, decided to do experiments with these mitochondria. And I actually myself did these experiments. Uh, and we found that indeed the mitochondria were able to import the protein, but then it would not properly assemble. We had various examples of mitochondrial proteins that would then form uh, insoluble aggregates. Uh, and it became clear that there was a mitochondrial component called HSP60. HSP stands for heat shock protein. So it was, a, was the first chaperone that we worked on that was apparently involved with this. And this converged then with the biochemical experiments that we had been doing in our import system. And we could demonstrate that uh, proteins would first associate with this HSP60 in an ATP dependent manner. HSP60 is an ATPase. All that became clear then and that it would only reach its folded state in an ATP-driven reaction, uh, apparently in association somehow with this HSP60 component. Mm -hmm. And that resulted in two uh, articles in Nature that we published in 1989 and founded our contribution and, in, and interest in, in that field. We would then we were then realizing through the work of Georgiopoulos, for example, and John Ellis that, that this mitochondrial HSP60 was a homologue of uh, a protein that was already known in E. coli, although its function had not been known. That protein is called GROEL. And here you see some electron micrographs that we then soon later, uh, soon after obtained for GROEL. That was a collaboration with with the group of Baumeister at the Max Planck Institute, where I am now, but at the time I was at Munich University. And uh, so we, we realized that it was no longer productive to use just the mitochondria for these studies, because this protein could be purified in large quantities, and it requires a further factor called GROES. The L stands for large, the S for small. The, 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 the S is, is like a little lid on this uh, cylindrical structure. You can see it on this uh, last picture here. Uh, at that time, this was all not known, but we could purify these proteins and eventually could uh, 
reconstitute in vitro the folding reaction that we had observed in the mitochondria. This protein basically being the mitochondrial HSP60 equivalent. I read that um, when, you got, when you were looking at this, that you know, first of all, you thought, thought we need really good evidence to show this is the case, because yeah. obviously at the time, well, that, the dogma that's was true. that you know, pro proteins fold, <clears throat> you know, the sequence dictates the folding of proteins. There is no, there is no need yes. for other proteins. That to be was, of course, so. the reason why, I mean, I have to say that at this time, we had no idea about any possible medical implications that would perhaps arise. And we, I'm sure we can talk about this later. Mm -hmm. but, but it was immediately clear to us that if indeed the folding of a protein, even if there was only a single example of a protein that would not fold spontaneously but would require such a cellular machinery, that this would be a potentially important uh, and novel finding. And so we, we focused on that. But we had to be very careful, obviously, because generally people believed at the time, based on the work of Anne Finson, that folding reactions occur spontaneously, that the polypeptide chain is made on the ribosome. As it comes out, it folds somehow on its own, based on the information in the amino acid sequence. And of course, that, that finding that, and that insight that Anne Finson obtained from uh, in vitro refolding studies is absolutely correct. What is absolutely correct is that the amino acid sequence determines the folded state. But it may not be sufficient to tell the protein how to get there under cellular conditions. So I would say that the Anfinsen concept is, is correct, but it, is not, it was not complete. It did not include uh, an explanation for how folding could occur efficiently and at a biologically relevant time scale under conditions in the cell. And under cellular conditions, proteins have a very strong tendency to misfold and engage in aberrant interactions before they have reached their folded state, so they can form aggregates of different types. And that's where these machineries are then very important. So could you, from, from that discovery, I mean, you said you knew it was an important discovery, but could you see the implications that, of where... You know, we didn't think things? about any implications. We only were just interested in finding out how it works, and we were lucky to make that fire. We have to stress that, you know, this, nothing of that was planned in a way. It, it uh, just happened. But we did at least have the insight to, to realize that it could be interesting. I mean, that's the issue, you know, obviously uh, with funding agencies more these days, there seems to be a, you know, push for, you know, you need to think about how these discoveries will translate yeah. into a drug or, you know. Yeah, I, I, I am very skeptical. That, that you, you know, I'm very, essentially very skeptical about this attitude that we have similar problems in Europe from time to time and certainly in the U.S. as well, that, that research is now, you know, more and more programmed. Researchers are being told what they should investigate because it would be medically or otherwise relevant. And this is despite the fact that so many, you know, so many developments that really became useful in medicine came from pure curiosity-driven research without researchers having any idea about what this could possibly be good for or bad. <laughs> so I think we should really continue to strongly support basic research. Yeah, that yeah. observation driven, yeah. you know, curiosity, I think that's, and I was, I'm just reading from, so Art, um, who put an autobiography when you yeah. guys won the, the Shaw Prize, and it, I pulled out one little um, fragment that I thought was quite interesting. He said, the early interactions with Ulrich were electric, the two of us crossing the Atlantic to spend t time together discussing how this and other chaperone systems might work. As my wife describes, we would sit in our kitchen carrying on grow speak. Yeah. Discussions <laughs> of grow EL mechanisms sometimes until 3 a.m. on a nightly basis. So that, that is must have been true, and it was a time. very um, exciting time. We had, uh, he visited us in Munich. We went over, I went over to Yale, and uh, many phone calls. There was, there was no email at this time yet. <laughs> it would have been a lot easier nowadays. <laughs> but we had fax machines. The first fax machines actually were introduced while I was in the lab in Munich. And we also had, for the first time, the Macintosh computer that would us, allow us to, to make drawings much faster. <laughs> Before, you had to still 
make the ink drawings, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you just send them by yeah. fax across to see what Well, you, I made the ink drawing. It took about, perhaps a day to make a diagram. And then if you showed it to your supervisor, if there was a tiny little bit that he didn't like or she didn't <laughs> like, you had to redo the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> Not just the delete button. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I mean, the structure that you can, that, you know, the Grow EL and HSP 60 is, is just beautiful, isn't it? I mean, the idea, you know, that you can form this little cage, yeah. I think, you know, it's been described as like a confinement cell for proteins to sort of, you know, duck into and, and sort themselves yes. out. But that the right was way. then the next big question, obviously, how this HSP 60 Grow EL system would work. And uh, early on, we observed, for example, here you can see on the right side that when the, uh, when the, when the GROEL was not complexed with a substrate protein and unfold protein, the, the inner cavity would be empty. However, when we bound a protein, an unfolded protein, it would be filled with some additional mass, even though this was not well resolved, which is explained by the fact that it's not a defined structure. Mm -hmm. uh, and that suggested to us that perhaps the folding reaction actually occurs while the protein is in this interior space and would therefore be unable to aggregate with other unfolded proteins. I mean, it seemed to be an elegant possibility. So we set up experiments and it took actually several years to provide the final proof that this really was the case. It's now completely uh, accepted, but there was a very, this was a very hotly debate, debated area. Uh, sometimes even a bit personal, the debate. And uh, people just had difficulty to believe that a protein could fold within a cage that is made by another protein. It's almost like a mini test tube, or you, could, you should call it a nano test tube, actually. It's a very small space. And we now know that a protein, when it is inside in that, in that cage, it completely fills that space, has a very high uh, local concentration, almost like a protein in a crystal structure. And that probably has a strong impact on the way uh, it folds. Not only does it prevent aggregation, but uh, it also changes the pathway and the energy landscape of the folding reaction. That just became clear perhaps a year or two ago. But uh, the important step was to prove that folding really occurred inside the cage. and. Uh, different lines of evidence, different experimental approaches were used. But eventually, one could show that a protein reached its folded conformation while still being encapsulated. And it's very fascinating that, that the system has this additional cofactor called GROES, which really fits like a lid on a pot. And it encapsulates the protein. And it displaces it from its binding regions into this cage. And uh, we had made the prediction that in order for this to work, the hydrophobic surfaces on the GROEL, which capture the unfolded protein, unfolded proteins usually expose hydrophobic surfaces, that's why they are also aggregation sensitive, that these hydrophobic surfaces would have to be buried when the GROES binds, so as to allow the protein now to undergo folding and bury those hydrophobic regions. And that turned out to be correct and was uh, proven wonderfully by the crystal structure that was solved by uh, Paul Siegler in collaboration with the Horwich lab yeah, the a few years later. I yeah. mean, the mechanism, because of course, as you alluded to, the other, the other possibility and what other people were saying yeah. was this is just providing a surface, you know, this, is, this protein is just providing a surface to allow proteins to fold yes. by themselves. So what was the crucial, you know, that you thought was a crucial experiment? Was it the yeah, crucial some. experiment that, I mean, there were already in 1991, we published a paper in which we reconstituted the folding reaction. And we observed that throughout the folding reaction, a protein was, the folding protein was protected against aggregation. For example, we did experiments where we added casein, which is a uh, more or less unfolded, permanently unfolded protein, into our refolding reactions. And that strongly enhanced the aggregation of proteins, even of those proteins that were able to fold spontaneously otherwise in the test tube. <laughs> but as soon as we had the GROEL system present, such aggregation would be prevented. And only in the presence of GROES could the protein fold 
without undergoing aggregation. So it was highly suggestive of GROES being critical for creating this uh, secluded environment. But the evidence, then the direct evidence, came from uh, different studies. For example, we used cross-linking where we attached a, a folding protein to one of the domains of the GROES-L ring so that it could not possibly escape because the other model suggested that the protein is ejected from GROES-L into the bulk solution and that's where it folds and if such folding was not successful it would then rebind to the GROEL and undergo another cycle of binding and release and so on. That model has been termed iterative annealing. So in order to test that critically we attached the protein permanently and then we observed that it only folded when we added GROES. And that such and we could show that under the uh, in the presence of GROES the protein was encapsulated and it was protected from externally added protease. The Horwich lab at the same time did experiments where they used a version of GROEL, a so-called single ring version, where the uh, GROEL would not form its double ring structure as you can see here, but a single ring version and that single ring version was no longer able to release to dissociate the GROES. So it's like if you put a lid permanently on your pot you can never get the spaghetti out, it's inside. <laughs> and, uh, and that uh, mutant was also capable of folding a protein. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So when you, when you made this discovery, did you, did you think there must be more of these folding machines? Yes, so? and that was actually a very important, uh, in my view, a parallel development. At the time already when we became aware of the HSP60 type machine, we knew that there were other so-called heat shock proteins or stress proteins presumably involved in related reactions and most prominently these were the HSP70s. And uh, we asked ourselves why do cells have two different types of machinery seemingly for the same type of mm -hmm. process. And it seemed plausible to assume that perhaps these two systems were cooperating in a physiological folding a pathway and, uh, and there was already some evidence that HSP70 could recognize hydrophobic peptide segments, for example work of, of Jim Rossman and others, and uh, it seemed plausible that perhaps the HSP70 acts upstream of the GROEL type chaperone. And we were able to reconstitute such folding reactions where we saw that that the HSP70 by binding to hydrophobic segments of the polypeptide chain prevented aggregation of certain proteins, namely those that need the GROEL, and would no, but would not allow the folding of these proteins. HSP70 is also an ATP driven machine. It binds and releases a substrate, an unfolded protein, but it releases it into bulk solution. That's the big difference from this type of machine. But during this binding and release, those proteins that require GROEL can be kept in what we call a folding competent non-aggregated state. And they can be transferred to GROEL. So the HSP70 binds to the nascent chain as it emerges from the ribosome, keeps it folding competent. As soon as it is available, it will then stabilize it and transfer it to the GROEL. Other proteins, however, which do not need GROEL, that became clear later, they can use the HSP70 binding and release cycle for folding. So in the beginning we felt that perhaps HSP60 is the, is the general system that is required for most proteins, but we now know it is only required for a subset. And these proteins have specific structural features and folding pathways that make them dependent on the cage type environment. Other proteins can use the HSP70 that works upstream. So the, the whole system works like a, like a kind of percolator. You put your unfolded protein into the system on top. It will then interact with HSP70, bind and release. Those molecules that fold rapidly during this process will no longer reach GROEL. Others remain bound to HSP7, finally go through all the way to the GROEL system. And if you remove HSP70, we saw that later, then you completely overwhelm the GROEL system. There is no longer any selectivity 
whereas normally GROEL binds only to a specific subset of proteins and it has in fact a rather pronounced preference for a certain type of protein fold. It's um, interesting, I mean, that, and that's exactly, you know, yeah. the, the work you're doing now, which is beautiful to show the chaperone network and how that really works. And in, when you were talking, I was thinking about the proteins that we work on, the small heat shock proteins, how they, you know, can assist with HSP70 to yeah. make sure that, you know, HSP70 is doing its job to fold that set of proteins that, um, you know, that aren't going into GROEL maybe, that HSP70 exactly. is releasing, that, that's, but it's not ready yeah. to go. They're not supposed to go to GROEL because if that happens, then those molecules that actually require GROEL, which are usually of relatively lower abundance, will be competed out yeah. and will then begin to aggregate. Yeah. yeah. So the, I guess the, the chaperones, and, and they're around, you know, from one of your latest reviews, you, you say there might be around about 200, is that? Well, there are a large number of chaperones and in particular regulators of the chaperones. For example, when we did the HSP70 work, uh, we realized that probably HSP70 is not doing the job alone. We later learned that uh, from Tom Creighton, for example, a, a very important researcher in the protein folding field, he had uh, done some, tried some early experiments with Hugh Pelham, where they used uh, isolated HSP70, but they couldn't get productive reactions because only later did it become clear that HSP70 required cofactors. In the bacterial system, such cofactors were already proposed. It was the DNA J type, the HSP40, and a nucleotide exchange factor. So our reaction only worked when you had five proteins purified, namely the DNA K, which is the HSP70, the DNA J, the GRP nucleotide exchange factor, and the GROEL and GROES. And I'll never forget when uh, Thomas Langer, who was uh, a student at the time, did the first experiment. Yeah. We had everything was ready to go, <laughs> and the experiment worked beautifully immediately. However, after a few times doing it, it stopped working for quite oh, a while. Yeah. And then we had to, I mean, I don't even recall exactly what was the reason, but then it began to work again and has, has worked ever since. <laughs> So it, that was a really uh, a beautiful moment yeah. because not only did it support this idea of a sequential pathway, but it, it, it showed at the same time so many new things. It showed, for example, that the DNA J itself was a chaperone, that the GRPE was required for the release of substrate from HSP70 and then allowed the transfer to GROEL. Uh, if you only leave out GRPE, there is no folding. Yes. but also no aggregation because the protein stays bound okay. to HSP70. So it was just really beautiful. And obviously one of the areas that we're interested in at this university, and yeah. particularly Mark Wilson, is extracellular chaperone. So this idea that you, know, you have chaperones not only within cells but outside cells. Yes. Um, you know, have you got any thoughts on you know, how they might fit into that network? Well, I think that that's a very important area and in fact some, an area which has really been pioneered here. Uh, these are usually ATP independent chaperones. We know that not every chaperone must bind and hydrolyze ATP. This is a mechanism that it it is used by some of the major intracellular chaperones like HSP70, HSP60, and HSP90. But uh, chaperones that exist in compartments where there is no ATP can still uh, have very important roles in buffering aggregation. They bind to hydrophobic surfaces, I assume. And, but the off rates of the bound state is sufficient to either allow folding, uh, either alone or in the context of some additional machine that would perhaps be the case for the small heat shock proteins. And the extracellular chaperones, presumably their main role would be to, to shield potentially toxic uh, surfaces, dangerous surfaces of misfolded proteins. Yeah. Perhaps helping in deposition of these proteins in, in more benign aggregates. Uh, I guess Mark is really the expert yeah, on that. Suppose, yeah. Yeah, that's, I know that that's something yeah. that Mark and, and a lot of us are interested in, yeah. you know, how that um, synergy it's, it's, works It's an under, well. under-researched uh, area, which I think will become more and more important in the future, particularly because there are already relationships, genetic relationships between certain extracellular chaperones and uh, alt manifestation of Alzheimer's yeah. disease. Yeah. So how do you think and this is where the research is going, I think. How do you think that the chaperones in general fit into this? Is, 
uh, a figure yeah. from the 2014 well, paper. How does that fit into... I mean, we now, there is now a lot of talk about the so-called proteostasis network. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should explain to some and, of the audience uh, what proteostasis, proteostasis is. is just a short form of protein homeostasis. I'm not quite sure who coined the term, maybe Andy Dillon or... Andy Dillon was part of it. Yeah, <laughs> was part of it, and Morimoto and, and Bill, uh, Bill Balch, and Kelly. And Kelly. Yeah. Uh, and this term has really caught on yeah. <laughs> very well. So it's the idea that you have, uh, that cells basically allocate a lot of resources to not only the initial folding of proteins, but also to maintaining proteome integrity, the, the proper balance of the proteome, stoichiometry of different subunits of various protein complexes and so on, under a variety of conditions, particularly also including stress conditions, and uh, such as heat stress, for example, but also aging. And in, in this system, we have chaperones as a central uh, element, different types of chaperones that act in the early stages of folding, but also in stabilizing protein, proteins against unfolding during stress. And the other important element, I think, is the are the degradation pathways, yeah, uh, the, the autophagy and, and lysosomal pathway, but perhaps even more importantly, the ubiquitin proteasome pathway that serves to degrade those molecules that cannot fold properly or cannot maintain their folded states. Mm. And the chaperones cooperate closely with those machines uh, in order to prevent premature aggregation, because once a protein is aggregated, uh, it is much more difficult, apparently, for cells to dispose of those uh, misfolded states. And in addition, we know that when aggregation occurs, this results in populating various types of conformational species that can be highly toxic to cells. Maybe we'll talk about why they are toxic, <laughs> but it's not something that is fully understood, but it's obviously very important. Then the whole system, this proteostasis system, seems to be geared towards preventing the accumulation of these types of species. So there are different ways of achieving that. First of all, you want to fold your proteins properly. You want to stable, keep them stable in those states. You want to degrade what is not properly folded. Or you want to perhaps drive these smaller toxic aggregates into larger deposits so that they are again sequestrated from the cellular environment. Mm -hmm. And that's where perhaps the, the small heat yeah. shock that you study play a role. Yeah. So, I mean, um, obviously, and, uh, you know, so even though you were saying that, you know, the idea of chaperone and HSP60 was uh, driven out of observation, yeah. obviously since then, you know, we've realised that, sure. that these things actually yeah. might be a perfect target for looking at, you know, treatments of diseases that are associated with aggregation or such. Exactly. Where do you see the field? I mean, Often I think, you know, this is a, such a complex network and, you know, and, and protein homeostasis actually, you know, the term implies that the system will try and balance out things. Um, do you really, do you, how do you see the field in terms of developing drugs that actually target this network yes. as a therapeutic? Well, I perhaps should say that the time when this became clear to me was in 2000, that we should look specifically at the possible role of chaperones in the context with some of these diseases that are caused by protein aggregation. And, and we now know, of course, through the work of many groups, that there is a number of age-dependent, mostly neurodegenerative diseases that are characterized by the formation of certain types of protein aggregates, mostly these fibrillar types of aggregates that are sometimes called amyloid, and which probably represent an end stage of an aggregation pathway. And it is now, I think there is a good consensus that the process of formation of these types of aggregates is associated with cellular toxicity. In 2000, I listened to a talk by Erich Wanker from Berlin, who worked on Huntington's disease and had made some seminal findings that showed, together with others, that the expansion of a sequence in the Huntington protein a sequence that contains only of glutamine residues, so-called poly-Q sequence, that the expansion of such a sequence due to mutation, a heritable mutation, is the cause of Huntington's disease, and it is the cause of aggregation of the Huntington protein. Mm. 
or a fragment of the Huntington protein. So it became immediately obvious that we could use this particular model to study what chaperones would do with such an aggregating protein. And we were able, in collaboration with Wanka, to reconstitute the aggregation reaction in vitro and ask whether chaperones could interfere with aggregation. And what we saw was that the HSP70 system, again, HSP70 with, with its cofactors, was very powerful in suppressing what seemed to be the toxic aggregation pathway. And this suggested, therefore, that when this disease manifests, and it is apparently associated with this type of aggregation, that this must mean that the capacity of neuronal cells to prevent aggregation by chaperones such as HSP70 was no longer sufficient. And, it has, and then it became clear in, in, in subsequent years through work of Morimoto and Kenyon and others, also Dillon again and, and Kelly, that as cells age, the capacity of this proteostasis system seems to decline. And I believe nowadays that this is probably one of the major causes actually for IVH. <laughs> I don't know why the system declines. Probably it's no longer, there was no evolutionary pressure to maintain its capacity. Fortunately, it, it works quite well in us, <laughs> but I can tell you in, in worms, for example, or in Drosophila, it really breaks down yeah, a lot earlier. Body. As soon as they have, uh, after worms have laid eggs, uh, everything goes awry. So reproduce uh, there is no repro When reproduction <laughs> is, is, is fulfilled, then these systems no longer have mm -hmm. had evolutionary pressure to be maintained. Be maintained. If you intervene with reproduction, you can get worm mutants that are much more capable of maintaining proteostasis and they live a lot longer. So there is a good relation, a good correlation between the eff efficiency of these systems and longevity. And I assume that that will be the case in, in people who get very old. Such studies are now being undertaken for reasons that we don't quite understand. They might have more efficient ways of preventing toxic protein aggregation. So it follows from this that we must look for ways, perhaps pharmacologically, to activate those systems to a more, to a state that, that would be more similar in a, of what we find in a, in a younger individual. That might not prolong life, but it might prolong the healthy lifespan. And that's also the politically correct way of addressing this, <laughs> because there are, interestingly, for reasons that I don't understand, people who feel that it would not be legitimate to seek for ways to extend lifespan. Of, although we have been doing that for the last <laughs> decades very successfully. Uh, so we talk about extending the healthy lifespan. Yeah. It would be nice if we could enjoy our lives longer in a mentally alert state, for example, and not succumb to these uh, terrible uh, neurodegenerative uh, dementias. Yeah. Uh, so this is, there's been a lot of work going into this one figure over yeah. all of the years. So wh where do you think you know, what's the next challenge? What's the well, first of all, we don't really, I mean, I certainly don't yet understand how the proteostasis network functions. There is no real modeling yet of this network. You know, at some point you have to be able to understand how the different elements of the network cooperate, what are critical nodes. You have to be able to predict the behavior of the network under certain and, and at this point we are still in the phase of collecting data about the network. It's mm -hmm. a great term, but it's not yet full, not yet filled with, with the amount of information and meaning that, that we will ultimately need. Particularly, we will need this information if we want to interfere or to modulate the way it works, perhaps by using drugs. But what we, what we know already is that there are various transcriptional pathways, signaling pathways, such as the cellular, the cytosolic stress response pathway, or the an unfolded protein response pathway of the ER, or the mitochondrial uh, unfolded protein response that was, that was actually discovered by, by Hugenrat in, in, in Melbourne. And that these regulatory pathways play an important role here. 
in the response of the system towards various types of stresses. And aging is probably one of those. And we can now look for compounds, drug-like compounds, that activate some of these pathways. For example, it became clear that if we use a model compound that induces the cytosolic stress response, this compound is called gelatinomycin, and I can, I can specify how it works in a moment, but this compound upregulates the levels of various cellular chaperones, such as HSP70, HSP40, HSP90, and, and small heat shock proteins, and it is extremely potent in suppressing the aggregation of the hunting teen, of the pathological hunting teen molecule. So it would be great to find ways to treat patients with such compounds, mm -hmm. but we're still far away from that. The compound that we do have works by inhibiting one of the major chaperones, the HSP90, okay. and uh, the reason why it works is because the transcription factor that regulates all these chaperones in the cytosol is itself a substrate of HSP90. It is regulated by HSP90 and other chaperones. And as you inhibit HSP90, you are displacing the transcription factor, and it can then undergo an activation uh, pathway, which is very complex. Eventually leads it into the nucleus where it activates the transcription of these chaperone genes. But since these compounds inhibit HSP90 at the same time, they can be quite toxic. HSP90 is an important chaperone for many signal transduction molecules, and that's why these inhibitors are used in cancer therapy. Yeah. There you can, of course, afford a lot more side effects <laughs> than what you would want to have when you treat patients perhaps for long periods of time. Yeah. So we need something that is not toxic, but causes a similar upregulation not a very strong upregulation, but a mild upregulation, perhaps two to three fold of some of these chaperones. And it might be sufficient to, to treat people with such a compound perhaps once a week or once every two, and we don't know, but these, would, these are things that have to be carefully worked out. And, uh, but I strongly believe that there is, is potential for this type of drugs. Jose? on a couple of things that you've talked about. So you've mentioned uh, toxic aggregates, specifically you've mentioned Huntington's. Yeah. Why do you think that, so in the case of Huntington protein, which is expressed everywhere in the body and also in the brain, yes. why are those aggregates specifically yeah. toxic to striatal dopaminergic neurons? Why are toxic aggregates of A-beta specifically toxic to cholinergic yes. neurons? Do you have any? That is, I think, on? one of the central questions in this whole field. Uh, as you said correctly, uh, certainly, this is the case for Huntington, and I assume for some of the other disease proteins of neurodegenerative disease that they are not only expressed in neuronal cells, but also in other cell types and tissues, but only the neuronal cells, or at least strongly preferentially the neuronal cells, will show toxic symptoms, and not only the neuronal cells, but perhaps only specific subtypes of neuronal cells. So that brings us to the question of what underlies the toxicity of these aggregation processes. We don't really know yet what are the toxic species specifically or the range of toxic species. Presumably it's not only one type. Uh, and, and various possibilities have been suggested by different groups. One possibility that I find quite plausible and for which we ourselves have been able to provide evidence is that these aggregates, probably small soluble forms of the aggregates, are highly interactive. They expose hydrophobic regions. They expose unsatisfied beta strands. All these features will later be buried when they form these ordered fibrils. That's why we think the fibers are no longer are less toxic, let's put it this way. And by being interactive, these aggregates can now associate more or less transiently with a variety of cellular factors. And we have seen that they, they have a preference for cellular proteins, which themselves are structurally highly dynamic and contain so-called 
intrinsically unstructured regions. These are often those proteins in the cell that have the most interaction partners and play critical roles in regulating cellular pathways. So by interfering with those molecules, we think the aggregates can cause toxicity and they interfere not only with a specific pathway, but they could interfere simultaneously with multiple key cellular pathways. It's a little bit like if you had uh, you know, a, a complex machine like an aeroplane where you have a minor defect in one uh, engine, say, which the pilots can be easily cope, cope with. But if at the same time two or three other minor things happen, it will cause the whole system to collapse. And this is one model that we suggest plays a role. But we think that there are multiple mechanisms of toxicity. Another mechanism that has been proposed and for which some evidence has been presented is that these aggregates might uh, disturb the integrity of certain membrane structures in cells. And uh, obviously, this could cause a lot of problems. If you think of mitochondria, or uh, also the synaptic membranes and so on. Uh, and a third model, which I think is very closely related to the first one, is that these aggregates themselves cause an impairment of the proteostasis system, that they somehow uh, require and occupy a large capacity of the proteostasis system, for example, by interacting with certain chaperones or regulators of chaperones. And somehow, these interactions are apparent in nature and paralyze these systems. We have seen that one particular factor that is critical for the HSP70 system is the HSP40, as I mentioned before. And some of these HSP40s interact very strongly with these early forms of aggregates and can then be sequestrated into the final aggregate deposits. These factors may be rate limiting for the function of the HSP70 system. And then you get a vicious cycle where as aggregation occurs, the very cellular defense mechanism against these aggregates becomes undermined. This will then of course result in more aggregation not only of the disease protein, but also other endogenous proteins that are no longer able to fold properly or maintained in their folded state, and then it gets worse and worse. I think this plays an important role in propagating the disease mechanism. Now, why are certain cell types more sensitive to others? I don't think we really have a final answer to that, but if you think of the interaction model, you could easily imagine that certain uh, possible inter aberrant interactions with those aggregates are perhaps occurring preferentially with certain types of proteins that are particularly significant functionally in neuronal cells, cytoskeletal elements, for example. Neuronal cells have very complex architecture. There are long transport distances that have to be covered by various types of molecules, mRNA molecules and, and proteins. So interference with these mechanisms might hit neuronal cells much worse than other cells. Neuronal cells are post-mitotic. They do no longer divide. We have the, neuron, the neurons that we have in the beginning is all we have to, to, to live with. So uh, they are not able to uh, regenerate, for example, like a liver cell. And I think that's certainly an important factor that explains the higher sensitivity of neuronal cells. Uh, I guess that's basically where we stand at the moment. In Huntington's disease, we do know that striatal cells, as you said, uh, are the first ones to be affected. But as the disease progresses, other cell types uh, become affected as well. So it's not as if there is an absolute specificity for those neuronal cells. It's, it's just that these are the ones that are most sensitive. And I, I think it's, it's similar for other neurodegenerative diseases. <coughs> In the interest of time, I just want to I want to show one picture because I put yeah. it in, and this is your role now. Oh, obviously. okay. <laughs> so you've been the director of the Max Planck um, in the biochemistry department for the last 17 years. Is that? Oh, longer since longer. 1997. I'm not the director because well, the, the, every 
department chair is called a director yes. in the Max Planck system. So there are, I director, there are I, I'm a director, and occasionally, every couple of years, I am the director because that's a rotation, <laughs> and that's what that's we don't, and that's what we don't really like to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, obviously, um, there's a diverse group of people that you're managing. I mean, yeah. so you're, you know, where do you see, you know, your role now in terms of mentoring all of these people? Obviously, um, yeah. Well, first of all, when I time. look at this picture, I should say that I have been working very closely with my wife, manager, yeah, who is here on the, the right corner. side of it, and has made uh, many fundamental contributions to to all aspects of our work. So this has helped me a lot in being able to, to run a larger group. But we also have young group leaders that are working, who are working more or less independently or are developing towards independence. And they help, of course, in, in giving the whole system structure. So Otherwise, I, I, don't, I, mean. cannot, exactly, <laughs> I cannot uh, be responsible directly <laughs> for the projects of all these people. But I do have a smaller group of people I interact with more directly and, and intensively. Obviously not when I'm in Australia, <laughs> but uh, since there is now email and all this, yeah, it's, it's not so difficult. You, you can check that yeah. the results are coming in. So um, in the interest of time, we thought we'd open it up to a few questions from the floor, if there is any. Um, any pressing questions? Anyone's got? <laughs> well, I, we've got a lot of students here who probably feel a little bit intimidated to ask a question, but maybe you could give some advice for them as budding scientists. Is there anything that you would recommend that uh, our students should do or should uh, Yeah, this is always a question that comes up and is, of course, very difficult uh, to give general advice. I think the, f the most important advice that I would have for someone to go into uh, research and, and want to become a researcher or an academic career uh, is that that you have to be really passionate about it for the simple reason that there are so many disappointments <laughs> because nobody can really predict how an experiment will go and if you could then it would be kind of boring yeah, you didn't have to <laughs> and uh, there is always the hope of discovery and that's what has to be the main driving force. We don't really get rich by doing what we do. We have a good living, that's, that's all fine, but that uh, cannot be a driving force. And you have to be self-motivated. Uh, you know, we, we, we are very in a very lucky situation, that fortunate situation, that nobody tells us exactly what we have to do. We have to come up with it ourselves. Mm -hmm. And if you are successful, and if you reach a position like I was fortunate to, to, to achieve, then of course it's a fantastic uh, thing. You have great people to work with. Someone is usually having an experiment that uh, looks good. And, uh, <laughs> but if in an earlier stage of your career, you have to go through phases where things may not work for a while. And there are many circumstances that we cannot influence. So you have to be really excited. Once you experience that something worked, it should tell you that it can work again and it very likely will work again. So you have to be you know, reliant on, on that uh, prospect. I, like, I think I read something about, um, from, about looking for you know, an observation that yeah. maybe everyone sees but everyone misses I mean, at the that same is time. exactly the, 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 I mean, that's a really if you nice have that ability, of course, that's great, but it's hard to know whether one has it until yeah. one <laughs> makes <laughs> a discovery. Yeah. Also, in choosing a research problem, it's very important that you are really interested in it. So uh, I'm sometimes a little bit disappointed by today's generation of students that we see that when we talk to them and said, what would you like to do? Oh, it must be medically relevant. That comes, I mean, I'm not talking about anyone <laughs> in this room, and there's nothing wrong with that. If that's a major driving force, some people say my father died of cancer or my grandfather and I decided I want to help people to, mm. that's great. Maybe a little bit naive, I would say. I would like to see more students who say, I would like to understand this mechanism by which the cell solves this particular problem. Maybe unattached to any possible medical relevance at this point. And this could come later, as we have seen in so many, many cases, and including the chaperone field. We have certainly not been thinking about this in the beginning. So uh, don't let yourself be influenced too strongly by 
by the fashion of having to do something that is medically relevant. There's nothing wrong with doing that, but there's, there are also great problems in other areas. For example, my wife managed, uh, started again working on one of the most important proteins that is certainly not medically relevant because it's a plant protein, ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase oxygenase or rubisco. It is the most abundant protein in, in nature and is required for the assimilation of CO2 into organic matter. So the applications, the possible applications, of course, are immediately obvious. Every crop plant requires rubisco for growth. It's a very sluggish enzyme. If you can make a better form, maybe this would be useful. But this protein is completely dependent on the GROEL type chaperonin. In all plants, everywhere where you, not only plants, algae, cyanobacteria, uh, plankton in, in the oceans, and it requires additional chaperones that we discovered recently, or she discovered, namely those chaperones that put the subunits of this enzyme together into a very specific arrangement, and it cannot do it on its own. Not only is the folding of this protein not occurring spontaneously, but also the assembly. And we have now two or three factors that functions post GROEL in a sequence of steps to assemble this, this enzyme. And then there's another chaperone system that just maintains the enzyme in a functional state. It's a so-called AAA ATPase, which modulates and modifies the structure, so it removes an inhibitory molecule that occurs naturally as a result of its function, so it makes mistakes, these enzymes. So it's really a very troubled protein. And there couldn't possibly be a more important one, but it has absolutely no medical significance. Yeah unless in terms of, you know, you have to eat something, you know. Yeah. So I urge you to look for, <clears throat> for problems that are just interesting by themselves uh, and not necessarily think too much about, uh, you know, I can cure this disease or that disease. It usually doesn't work out that well. <laughs> Before we wrap up, I'll just get Darren to ask a question because I know. Hopefully a quick one. I'm just asking you to sort of put on your hat and forecast into the Huh. Say in the context of neurodegenerative disease, I wonder if you think that the most likely therapeutic outcome or the most, most promising therapeutic outcome is going to be preventing build-up or accumulation of the toxic species, whatever that may be, giving the cells more capacity yeah. to deal with that or regenerating the damaged neurons, which do you think is more likely? I have, to I, it's very hard to say. and I mean, we are, with regard to activating the systems that we have talked about, we are still very far away there could still be downsides to that. Uh, I think we will probably learn a lot from understanding how model organisms age and the genetic regulations that are behind, uh, you know, regulating longevity like in the worms or so, and perhaps uh, modulating these types of pathways could, could be helpful. It probably will be more than one thing and what is good for one neurodegenerative disease may not work for another one. These are still quite different entities. In some cases, we don't really quite know what the disease molecules are. So it, it's, I think there is a lot of work to be done for many years to come. Yeah. Well, with that, I might um, thank you, Ulrich, very it's much for you yeah. know, coming around and well, just having this informal little, chat. Um, um, we have a little gift for you. Ah, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank it you. Will, hopefully it'll fit into your suitcase. And, I think so, yeah. <laughs> Looks like it might fit. I saw, <laughs> I, I saw your wife's suitcase and it's big enough for, to, to put something else in yesterday. And um, obviously we're glad to have you here for the Proteostasis Conference and we'll get to hear more, those that are attending, get to hear more about what you're doing um, now and what your group are doing at the mm -hmm. moment. So, uh, but again, thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.